There's nothing much between this house and America except the sea. It's here where David Cornwall lives, in Cornwall, a few miles from Land's End. The fact that he's called David Cornwall and he lives in Cornwall isn't very significant. He wasn't born here, he wasn't brought up here, but he loves the place, particularly for its isolation. He's rather better known as the novelist John le Carre. The fact that he's called John le Carre isn't very significant either. When he was working in the Foreign Office, he needed a pseudonym because that was what the Foreign Office demanded of him. He was travelling on top of a London bus, looked out of the window, saw Le Carre and adopted it. It is significant that he's one of the few serious English novelists to have a very high international standing and very vast international sales. That began with his third novel, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Since then, he's written several novels. Most of them have been very highly praised. None more than his last novel, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And his latest novel, just out, is called The Honourable Schoolboy, and it's a sequel to Tinker Tailor. It contains many of the same characters, and particularly George Smiley. George Smiley appeared on the first page of John le Carre's first book, and here he is again, now in control, in fact, control, head of the British Secret Services. The Honourable Schoolboy takes place, a great deal of it, in Southeast Asia, and to write the book, uh, John le Carre commuted, after a fashion, between Cornwall and Southeast Asia. I spent some days with him here in Cornwall at the end of winter talking to him about his life and his literary career and particularly about the Honourable Schoolboy. I love countryside and I love the peace it brings. And I like the balance that, that to go off and collect material, uh, to top up the batteries and to come down here and burn alone is what I like and to walk uh, over these shaven hills and populate them with the creatures of my own imagination is for me a tremendous experience I, I love it so was there any connection at all in your family with such uh, isolated living did anybody looking back did anybody take themselves off and live no uh, quite the reverse uh, i was brought up at least in my early childhood uh, by my grandparents and their family and they were extremely together and everybody knew what everybody was doing in each room and i've always been brought up i think uh, in a world without books and without self-entertainment uh, and it wasn't until i was really in my late teens that i was conscious of being an extremely private person in the group when you say together the uh, the integration came a great deal of it through religion didn't it? It came in, in the early times through religion, through religion imparted by my grandmother and, and her children. It also came through stress because my father, who's now dead, had appalling financial troubles and an amazing Micawber-like talent for messing up his business adventures, uh, so that he was often, uh, to put it its most polite, away, and uh, so that um, my education was taken over by people who were very much concerned about the way I might go and who were trying to replace the disciplines of an absent father. Uh, so that religion, both in my early childhood and later when I got to public school, to Sherborne, which I really profoundly hated, uh, was offered to me as an alternative to life's temptations. Your mother died when you were very young, didn't she? No, she didn't die. No, no, she's alive. But um, for a whole lot of complex family reasons, I didn't see her after the age of about five until the age of about 21. And with your father away, did you feel in that sense, I mean, is it too easy to say that you felt rather deserted in that way? Yes, I, I think I felt deserted. And it, the most hypnotic thing, if I... I'm self-indulgent and think about that time is how little I remember. And uh, in so far as writing uh, is a solitary experience where one dredges around in one's subconscious, I often think that the things that come to me perhaps belong to that, that rather closed-off time in my life. I'm aware now and then uh, of great surges of self-pity about being alone at that time and not knowing where my mother was and not knowing where my father was also. But much more than that, I think it, it threw me inwardly upon my own resources. 
the social pretensions of my, uh, my father, his ambitions, uh, all were entirely middle class. He longed, as, as a grammar school boy, as a, as a very talented man and a very flawed one, he longed to make of me a respectable guy. And I think that the attraction which institutions had for me uh, was an extension of his own longing to get me into the law, for instance, or to get me to be a doctor. And uh, really, out of that childhood, I found myself propelled towards Eton as a schoolmaster, the brand names, the good housekeeping certificate profession, uh, from there to the foreign office. Um, and I was really looking for somebody who didn't exist. Uh, I'm not, by nature, in the least respectable. When you say it was Mikolbalai, when you saw him and were with him, did he illuminate your childhood? Do you remember Yes, that? yes. And these monster daddy figures who appear sometimes in the books, this, these, these uh, portraits of beguiling evil, I think, uh, emanate also from a wish to come to terms with an extremely explosive and dynamic figure uh, who had this incredible talent for, for messing up his own life. Did he arrive in your life with presents and promises and that sort of work. Presents, promises, tremendous portraits of respectability. How did he explain his absences? Um, he didn't. Um, and it was part of the secret atmosphere in which we lived that nobody was explained. Nobody's absences were explained. Nobody's occupations were explained. Um, and when uh, my mother, for her own reasons, um, faded away from our lives. It was never spoken of. Uh, and if I asked my grandmother, she would say, shush. Uh, and equally, my father's long absences um, were, were given a heroic quality. He's away earning money, or he's away um, so that you can go to public school, or to private school. Or um, and it was only much, much later when I I always have this fantasy that I'll write a biography about him. Um, there are very gothic qualities to his life. And discovering, for instance, that my prep school fees were paid partly in dried fruit during the war. <laughs> <laughs> um, so both my older brother and myself were watchers, I think, and, and tremendously wary of promises. Uh, Promises like, I'll come down and take you out from school on Sunday. And then I would walk down to the end of the drive and wait. And he didn't appear. And rather than go back and lose face, I would just walk around and miss lunch and come back and pretend at five o'clock I'd had a great day. Uh, so that duplicity um, was really inescapably bred in me. Um, when people ask me, but you must have been a spy, weren't you? Uh, I always say yes from the age of five or six. But on so many levels already, because mm. the people you were living with weren't telling mm. you the truth. No. The people you were born of weren't telling you the truth. No, and I wasn't. And you that, weren't that's right, I wasn't telling the truth myself. Yeah. Um, it's quite a burden for a child. Well, it, it, it was one which was much easier to carry uh, because uh, of having a fantastic nature, or perhaps it breeds a fantastic nature. I mean, one that inclines naturally to the escape into fantasy. I, I think sometimes if I hadn't been able to write, I, I began by trying to paint and draw. I had a very strong wish to create and to be, to be private and constructive. Um, and I had absolutely no examples. I knew nobody who did anything like that for a living. And uh, precious little encouragement, either of my prep school or of my public school, to go in that direction. And so I, I, I tried to draw, but um, I mean, drawing is not something you can really do without instruction. But I did do some book illustration and book jackets and things. But if I hadn't discovered writing, uh, I think that in, in some ways I, I would have just drifted into delinquency. I didn't realize that so much fabrication had gone on from such an early age in your life. That e just as mm. your father must have told you stories, you must have told yourself stories about him and yes, about your mother. Yes. You must have made well, them up in a way. We did, and children like to speculate, but they're normally anchored to certain constants, but we had none. And therefore, uh, the speculations became amazing and right up into my teens. For instance, I wondered whether my father was some great spy uh, who went off and did 
uh, nationally vital thing. It was very modest about it. Did you ever talk to him? <laughs> Did you ever talk about him to the other boys? Did they challenge you as to... Uh, yes, and then, of course, it was necessary to paint a portrait of him. But was it, it a constant for it? Did you change it from one year no, to no, another? No, no, I changed it. Uh, and uh, I find also, even in describing myself, that, that uh, I change a great deal. I think it's quite wrong to suppose one is a constant. Uh, again, it's only within the pages of a manuscript that one is a consistent person. You have to go back uh, in, in, the, in the construction of character. I think you have constantly to go back and say, no, he wouldn't do this. Uh, I once, once uh, watched a great actor in one of my films arranging himself in front of the mirror, and he was talking about the character he was proposing to be. and. Uh, the reflection was in the third person, and I think that my characters are third person reflections. And so, in a sense, again, you're finding consistency in your fiction. Yes, which, that's right. Which you don't find in your own life. Well, the curious thing is that uh, the more one finds contentment in one's work, one's, one's work uh, then the more of a of a settled individual one becomes, and therefore there is a uh, a spin back. I think that. Um, the discovery of novel writing, which after all I only made at 30, uh, made me, in fact, a nicer person. Uh, because I was then able to be on terms with my fantasies and aspirations. And so when did you get the picture straight about your own life? At what age do you remember thinking, oh, God, that's what's happened? Well, it, it, I think I got it straight through a series of involvements and escapes. Uh, I, went, I, I went to Oxford, and of course I, what we haven't talked about is ambition. I mean, my father always constructed around him the apparatus of success, supercars on the hard purchase, great houses that he couldn't pay for, vast business schemes, fantastic entertainment, lunches and things. Uh, and I, that made me very, very hungry for those things. I mean, well, I don't think one should ever underrate just naked ambition. So I was ambitious. And when I arrived at Oxford, um, then I, I thought maybe I could take academia by storm. Maybe a Don's life is for me. Maybe I'll, I'll flirt with this for a while. And I had no real academic grounding at all, and I'd had a sort of messed up education in, in Switzerland and so on. But I really went for academic success and, and acted, if you like, the intelligent person. But I knew then that I didn't want, in fact, to proceed with the dawn's life. So that was one negative. Then I became a respectable young schoolmaster, and a couple of terms at Eton persuaded me that neither the boys nor I wanted me there. Uh, then uh, I went into the Foreign Service, took the late entry exam, and I knew again that that was, for me, an unacceptable way of life. And so I was involved, and then I, I escaped. And uh, the impulse uh, to, to take on the defector's cloak and strike against the institution which had tried to embrace me was overwhelming. And, and yet uh, the, inst the impulse to conquer the institution was equally powerful. Was, was equally powerful. Uh, and therefore, I think that I understand the structure of betrayal. And I think that I, I can naturally relate to the Burgesses and the Maclean's uh, who, who were ambitious within the institution while loathing it. But in fact, in all those things, you. Uh, in your father's terms, did remarkably well. You got a mm. first at Oxford, so you could yes. have been an academic. When mm. you were a school teacher, you were a school teacher in what is called the best school in England. Yes, and uh, did it when you went into an institution, you went into the Foreign Office. Well, I, I think I have a robust intellect, uh, but it's not one which would have um, flourished indefinitely in that institutional context. Is there any connecting uh, uh, theme which made you turn aside from these three? massive institutions, mm. scholarship, uh, a career as a helper of other people, and a career as a, in the wider world of um, diplomatic politics. Mm. Is there something you can think of all of them had in common that you made you turn away from them? Well, I, I think, firstly, a terrible sense of insufficiency, my own insufficiency, uh, a terrible sense of lability, that uh, um, that was the first thing. Actually, I didn't care. And when I became a wandering preacher uh, for the British Embassy in Bonn on British attitude towards the common market and those things, 
uh, and I found myself being tremendously smooth and persuasive at lectures around the halls in Germany. And I walked away just because I don't give a hoot whether we get into the common market or not. It is absolutely idiotic. Uh, and, and they need somebody with convictions. I have none. So an absolute sense of, of, of insufficiency in terms of persuasion, that was the first thing. That uh, I felt like a false priest, if you like, inside the church each time. That really these people and their, their standards have absolutely nothing to do with me. Uh, so a terrifying distance from it. Uh, then I think beyond that again, the creative uh, spin-off from that was, was an overwhelming urge to parody it uh, and to write about it and reconstruct it and, and synthesize and organize it, which would, when I started writing, which got me out of bed at, at five to six in the morning and I would write for two or three hours before doing a day's work. And uh, the, the, the visual impact, for instance, when I started work in the Foreign Office and I was commuting from Great Missenden of those faces in the morning and those people and their conversation in the train and uh, the absolute treadmill of the commuter life, uh, that again drove me uh, almost um, into the ground and the only way to react against that was to buy a bunch of little notebooks and instead of trying to open up the Times and read it, uh, I, I began writing little books. Um, so that to be repelled by the institution was also to be propelled into a creative life, I think. But uh, I, I am vain enough to believe that whatever my engagements might have been, I would continue to escape from them and write. It simply happened to be the successive accidents, which were, of course, in terms of delivering material, have been tremendously profitable. You were brought up in what could be called a strictly Methodist, wasn't it, household? Uh, initially, yes, yes. yes. Anyway, hymn singing, nonconformist, really. hymn singing. Yes, and, uh, yes. I don't know how much of it there really was, uh, how many years it lasted for. Uh, it, it, it lasted through the, uh, the twilight period of my father's absence, and I think that's why I remember it so acutely. And we got a lot of chapel, and I, I remember the, the red pine, and uh, the very uh, sort of the hammering um, sermons, and uh, I remember also the the extraordinary disproportion between the kind of um, straightforward church and empire Anglicanism we were getting then at private school and later at public school, uh, as opposed to this um, strangely. Um, lower class form of religion, if you like, um, because uh, one should never suppose that uh, the class system hasn't found its way into the kingdom of Christ in <laughs> English life, it has. But the false priest goes throughout your books, doesn't it? I mean, yes. you, you talked about in institutions you found out about betrayal. Yes. But betrayal, you said it with such emphasis that you clearly meant betrayal of the sort which would have been understood to be a bit pretentious, but I think accurate, by Judas. It's that sort of thing that you're yes, interested yes, in, aren't you? Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, and therefore, did the parameters of loyalty come from the, that religious uh, focus that was given you in the childhood? Fundamentalism uh, is, of course, um, very much inherent in, in the political themes which I touch on, I mean, also in this latest book, that uh, there is um, that, that, that qualified commitment is not enough. Uh, and when one moves this into the secret world, into the spy world, then, for instance, I have George Smiley saying, warning his, uh, his emissary, who is in fact the hero, before he sends him off to Hong Kong, he says, in effect, either you're in or you're out. As far as I'm concerned, this war began in 1917 with the Russian Revolution. There is simply no halfway house. Remember it. And he says, I... Uh, I myself, uh, I come from the generation which feels it's a privilege to pay, in effect. Uh, and I'm grateful to this service that's given me the opportunity. And once again, he says, either you're in or you're out. He seems to detect in the man he's sending a certain uh, carefree levity. <laughs> there is very much the absolute nature of your in, your out. I would have brought up the smiley thing if you hadn't. That's yes. There is a God, or there isn't. You believe That's in right. That's On the right. other hand, your response to the service mm. and smiley's response, which is that, which goes on through book after book and it becomes infinitely more complicated and 
almost like an mm. ever receding mirror. It's it's a yes. marvelous progress of I think one of the most powerful contemporary characters in fiction, far and head and shoulders above well any other character I can think of. Um, but that's always a personal response mm. because although he expect accepts his absolute commitment. Yes. He is worried about it, anxious about the degree of it, all yes. the time. Isn't well, you see, I believe that Which this is, very is the correct moral posture. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you argue, for instance, that the, the posture of the West altogether is that we give the maximum amount of freedom to every individual, while at the same time we have to present a cohesive front to the East, then you already get a dichotomy. Yeah. And you ask yourself the age-old question of what can we do in the defense of our loosely associated forms of freedom? and remain a society which is still worth defending. And uh, it is an absolutely insoluble anomaly of our times that we have to organize our disparate selves, our chaotic and amiable notions of democracy, into a defensive block. And the moment we cease to question our relationship to the institutions we've created, we've really lost the distinguishing mark which, in our opinion, elevates us above that monstrous Bolshevism. From your childhood, there's the foreground of constant maneuvers and deceits and mm. lies and mm. inventions to keep going. Yes. And there's the middle ground of school institutions and religious. And yes. there's this deep background of what you were really doing, which you say when you think very hard, you don't think you don't bring up very much. Well, one reason why I resisted is because if I let myself really remember, I would simply be left with a mass of self-pity. Because we also went to holiday schools, you see. Uh, so that we went straight from one boarding school. I went to my first boarding school at the age of five. And we went straight from there to other institutions. To I remember going to Bruton School for, for the whole of the summer holidays. New classrooms, new dormitories, new, uh, new institutional connections. Yeah. And from then, inwardly at least, I was always the little boy who wanted to run away. And you did, again, rather remote, you just walked out of Sherpa. I walked out of Sherpa, yes. I was by then beginning to feel my oats a bit. That must have taken a bit of nerve. You just packed your bag and left. Yeah, I told my father I wouldn't go back, yes. And then he said, well, he was going to tell, he was going to tell them. Uh, <laughs> I said, well, Christ, thank you. You're going to do it. It's your mess. <laughs> so uh, I went and uh, I went and saw uh, my housemaster then. And he had already written to my father to say that my advice is absolute because I am the professional you employ to educate your son. And I went and saw him and he said, well, this is the moment of choice. You choose between God and the devil. And I'm afraid I chose the devil. <laughs> and so I, I was then 16 and I just had O-levels. And you said that you hated the public school that you went to? Yes, apparently. yes. Uh, I, I think I still do, too. Uh, it seemed to me to be a very, very brutal place. Uh, but I'm sure it isn't the same place today. We're talking 30 years ago. Did you mean brutal in the straightforward sense of beatings? Yes. Uh, I, I've never uh, endured such pain as when I was made to hold the taps of the basin, shove my head in the basin, and, and be flogged with a piece of uh, cane. Uh, and, and for really idiotic offences, like successively leaving one's clothes down in a changing room, uh, not disciplinary matters as I would ever understand them at all. Uh, this, of course, has made me an extremely soppy father. <laughs> you were a painter for a year or so. Mm. In those days, my hero was the kind of guy who does little spot drawings for the observer, like Harrow, and I thought I could make that kind of living. Uh, and it was incidentally a compromise I envisaged where I would do commercial art on the one hand and then uh, pursue my immortal soul on the other. Caricaturists traditionally observe people very, very closely and yet uh, you describe yourself as having a very bad uh, visual eye as a writer yes. and have to and take photographs in order to examine things and look at things. And yes, I, I think I have a very uh, retentive memory for things like atmosphere, but th uh, the, the practicalities of a building, uh, which I'm repeatedly describing, for instance, like the British Secret Service headquarters, which I call the circus in these various books, uh, I, I do have, somebody writes from Dorking, pointing out that there were 
no steps on the third floor to the fourth floor and what the hell's happened to the building since and so on. And really, if I had time, I'd have a model made. Uh, but the, so I take photographs in order to escape um, some of the more crass criticisms. Uh, and equally, I have no sense of geography, no sense of direction at all, so that um, some frightful critic of the spy who came in from the cove took it into his head to pursue Alec Lemus uh, while he was taking counter surveillance through London and found that if he'd taken all those buses and those underground railways, he'd finished up in Hendon rather than Piccadilly Circus or something of that sort. That's <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> yes. In those days, I wrote tremendously fast. I wrote the first novel in about, I suppose, 10 or 12 weeks of, of commuting. The, uh, then there was a second book, which, uh, in Murder fact, I wrote quality. in Bond, Murder of Quality. And, uh, I then took Eaton and set it in the buildings of Sherborne, called the place Khan. And that was probably my first excursion into uh, a quite ruthless examination of social attitudes. And incidentally, what we were talking about earlier, the business about class and religion comes out very strongly there, I think. There's the, the people who are chapel and the people who are Church of England and so on. Uh, that I wrote in Bonn in the early mornings when I, I was on my first foreign posting. Uh, are you that, not giving up your job because you can't afford to or because you're a bit frightened to? Uh, well, I, I also, it seemed like a hobby at first. Um, and I was frightened to, but I, I gave my accountant then, who, um, I, I, when I started making a thousand a year, whatever it was, out of writing, it was worth, simply worth having an accountant. And I gave him a standing instruction that if I was ever worth £20,000, he should send me a cable and I would resign from the Foreign Service. And so I wrote Murder of Quality in, in Bonn. And then uh, I was politically involved. In, for the first and perhaps the only time in my life, I really felt extremely, virulently anti-communist about Berlin and what was going on. And I was in Berlin watching the wall being built. And uh, that was like seeing one's first dead body. That was an absolutely appalling sight and of monstrous cruelty of people. One forgets now that they were jumping out of windows and being brought away by the fire brigade and people died and people were shot and so on. And I didn't see, I didn't see actually any dead bodies or shooting uh, until I got to this recent book. But the, the, the sight, the actual experience of, of a great political and potentially apocalyptic event uh, was extraordinary. And to see Russian tanks brought up nose to nose almost with, with American tanks, and they're revving the engines because in those days with a big tank you had to keep them warm if they were going to advance. And, and to watch uh, Leitner, as he then was, the American advisor, going through the checkpoint and testing the responses all the way through and everybody dropping the safety catches in their guns. That was extraordinary. So I shot back to Bonn then and wrote The Spy Who Came From the Cold in three or four months. And it came out at... I, I didn't look back. Which opens so, with somebody at the wall. Which opens with somebody at the Berlin Wall and closes with somebody at the Berlin Wall. And different I, sides. That's right, different sides. And I, I didn't... Uh, look over my shoulder, so to speak, while, while, while I was writing it. And it came out at about a quarter of a million words, which I then cut in the ratio of five to one and, and got it down to about 50,000. And I knew then that I'd written something pretty good, actually. I, I think I pretended at the time that I was overwhelmed by success, but I think that was probably a lie. But you could and did mm. very soon get out because mm. you had the money to do it. Well, uh, I, I thought that I couldn't go on writing like a journalist with the immediacy of experience, uh, which was what had happened in the spy came from the cold. I mean, I, I, I saw a situation, rushed off, fantasized about it, wrote about it at breakneck speed. And uh, so I, I knew that I had to find a new modus operandi, really. I, I was also, I mean, thank heaven it was my third book and not my first, uh, but I was tremendously shocked by success. And uh, I mean, I like argument. I don't like being listened to indefinitely. And I do clam up if people expect me to behave like a celebrity. I really do find that, you know, I have my, of course, as we all do, my, uh, my megalomaniac streaks, but it doesn't take that form, uh, my particular ego. And uh, um, that was extremely hard to live with. And therefore, uh, right from the beginning of, of 
the new Le Carre, because you're never the same after success. You, you really aren't. Uh, whatever they tell you. Has it spoiled? Well, it may not have spoiled whoever the great guy was, but it certainly will have altered him. Uh, and that was the first time that I went somewhere where, um, w namely Crete, uh, where my success and, and the money that went with it uh, had absolutely no impact on the local community. And I suppose one of the things that this place means to me is that actually nobody gives a hoot I mean, th that I write. Uh, in fact, they're rather sorry for me. Mercifully, I had a second name, uh, which was forced on him by Foreign Office Protocol, and I'd been able to hide behind that a great deal. Have you found it very useful, being John Le Carre? Uh, being David Cornwall, I found very useful. Yes. Uh, and not being John Le Carre. And it, it, it spares me in two ways. Uh, firstly, that um, I, I'm not introduced as John Le Carre wherever I go, and so I can speak with moderate quietness and not get uh, into a corner. And people ask me whether I write with one pen or two. Uh, but secondly, it, it spares me the agony of saying, I'm John Le Carre, and meeting blank faces, which is much worse. <laughs> Why do you think that so many people want you to have been a spy? Is it partly to do with the fact that people don't really want to believe in fiction? I think that's very true, yes. Uh, but uh, it doesn't hold for them. Uh, if they would love to believe that there are people who can individually perform acts which save society, that there are people for whom all the laws can be broken, that they, they can become um, sort of government-employed fornicators, they can um, put all the, they, they can bring to life all the consumer goods a la James Bond, so that a car is suddenly an exciting thing, a cigarette lighter doesn't just light cigarettes, it takes photographs, and the Bond type of hero has one thing only, to dignify him and excuse him, and that is the monstrous enemy. Without Dr. No, he's just a rather rude little middle-class uh, um, executive who's behaving very badly, spending a lot of money. Uh, but with Dr. No, then he becomes a kind of crusader. And people long to believe in that simplistic view of conflict, uh, and conflict which then licenses misdemeanor uh, but they know that it isn't like that, really. Uh, and therefore, uh, once you start to confuse the issue and raise the terrifying question of who the enemy really is, uh, you get into an area of reality. Uh, and I think that once a reader relates to reality, albeit reluctantly, perhaps, uh, to the illusion of reality, at least, he starts to blame the writer. And he also starts to believe that the writer must be telling the truth. That's right, yes. I mean, if I had written Susie Wong, uh, I presume that people wouldn't ask me whether I'd run a cat house in Hong Kong. Depends who was interviewing me. Depends who were interviewing <laughs> me, of course, and as you know, I have. But uh, if, um, if you write a spy story, uh, or then people say to you, but you must have done it, haven't you? you know, come on. And yet at the same time, again, the paradox is that those you were saying, they're terrifically pleased that the office of the Secret Service in the circus in all your books is rather like um, their own. And I think they like the little things. They, they like the notion of uh, a, a pavement artist, as I call him, a surveillance man, uh, maybe staying out a little hour longer so that he can fiddle his expenses or get on to double time. In Call for the Dead, in the first few pages, you establish a character uh, George Smiley, you establish his, what he's up to, his conflicts about mm. loyalty, yeah. it is family with his wife, with his uh, job, with his subordinates, it's all done bang, all, all right away, yes. uh, at once, the kernel yes. of a lot that happens and is unraveled and unraveled and unraveled in the rest of your novels, yes. starts there. Yes, that was Balzac for me really, I, I read a lot of Balzac uh, at around that time and I love him. And Balzac will uh, just show you a room, exactly like Cinema Verite. He, he, the camera will move very, very slowly around the room, as Balzac writes. Uh, there was a pair of slippers here, there was this, the inkstand had this and that. Uh, and finally, in a corner of the room, he discovers his character and tells you who he is, what he earns, and everything. And once Balzac has put together the arithmetic of his character, he delivers him to you. And I think I did consciously take a leaf from his book for that purpose. 
And also, uh, as I go on writing, I find that Balzac's habit of taking a small character from one book and blowing him up into a big character in the next book, I think I also took that from the Comédie Humaine. In fact, Jerry Westbury, the honourable schoolboy of the honourable schoolboy. That's right. He, he, he had a walk-on party. Tinker Tank. Tinker Tank. That's it. Yes. yes, that happens all the time. But mm. you're obviously preoccupied with this great character, Smiley, who yes. turns up in Call for the Dead and in Murder of Quality and yes. in Spy and yes. in Tinker Tailor, of course, an honourable schoolboy. Yes. Uh, well, what is it that preoccupies well, you? Well, so I, I originally invested him with attributes which I feel as an uncomfortable person that I possess. I, I can never dress properly, and that Smiley spends, seems to spend a great deal of money on really bad clothes. I, I think where we meet him in the Honourable Schoolboy, uh, he has finally taken a political stand uh, in matters where he was earlier ambivalent, uh, which is, I suppose, an indirect sign to my readers that I'm entering middle age <laughs> and becoming a uh, Fusty and old reactionary. Smiley not only goes on from book to book and develops mm. from book to book, but takes you through changing phases of uh, British strength and British attitudes towards uh, Russia, towards America. The Brit Britain's reach grows shorter, and then, and so it's a his it's a history of the middle of the century as well as he takes you through all that as well. Yes. But what he also does, which is fascinating, mm. is that he employs many of the same. Um, imaginative faculties as a writer. Yes, that's right, yes. Why did you d decide to follow up Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy with the direct sequel of The Honourable Schoolboy? What was the thinking behind that? Because it seemed to me to be a perfect metaphor of our times. If you take, I don't want to take the analogy too far because it's very pretentious, but if you take the circus as being the vessel into which one has put all sorts of English attitudes, both social and individual, uh, and you then, um, you then say the circus is absolutely on its uppers. Uh, it's without credit in the world or in Whitehall. Uh, there's an absolute loss of confidence. And then you start from there. At least for the Anglo-Saxon reader, you have an immediate, if only si subconscious, point of reference. So that uh, insofar as it's good manners for a novelist to create an atmosphere or create uh, to, to dress characters in easily identifiable terms. That seemed to me to be a perfect situation for our modern times. Smiley is essentially lonely. He's yes. the loneliest man in contemporary fiction, in yes. a way. And yet he has a hold on the truth, doesn't he? Yes, he does. How do you manage to give him that? Well, because like me, he gets the best of both worlds. Uh, when the Soviet Literary Gazette reviewed Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, they called me a spy with a tear in his eye. Uh, and I suppose that uh, Smiley does conform reluctantly, but he also has the luxury of expressing his individualism. Uh, so that uh, through that double standard, um, there is a kind of truth. But Smiley is unresolved. He's also um, someone who comes very close to, and often in fact does, employ the same methods as the enemies whose methods he detests. Absolutely. Uh, of that there's no doubt, and indeed it's becoming increasingly clear that the West has resorted to that um, for a long, long while. Uh, and Smiley is not pleased with himself on that score. And there is a scene in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, the last book, where he actually meets his Soviet counterpart and they, they speak to one another uh, in, in the terms of their separate cultures and both agree absolutely straight away that they're using the same methods. Uh, and um, I think in, in The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, uh, Control, who was then the head of the British Secret Service, says to his agent, uh, don't ever make the mistake of comparing philosophy with method. We compare method with method and philosophy with philosophy. And the methods are much the same. Uh, nevertheless, I don't actually believe, despite all revelations about the CIA and SIS and so on, I don't actually believe that the West does go quite to the extremes that the East has gone. But it's only a matter of degree. It's arguable. And in fact, it's irrelevant. The West would, if it were necessary. So you know, Britain on. hits back through Smiley. Yes. With Tinker Tailor's Ode Aspired, written a sort of cycle, and all been set in Europe. And I'd never really taken my own sights outside Europe. 
uh, I'd never said anything about the United States, although I'd been there quite a lot. Uh, and I had never physically been east of Suez. And I thought that the time really had come for me to try and take on something that was much more difficult than writing safely within the margins of my ability. And uh, one of the charms of the English taxation system is that if you have an enormous income, you pay a lot of taxes. But you can also, if you're a writer, spend a great deal collecting material. So I set myself up as a commuter to Southeast Asia, really. I'd never seen war. I'd never really been involved in, in, in any of that direct conflict. I'd never been shot at or anything of that sort. Never seen dead bodies and, and, and the agony of war. And so I, I went off with a blank sheet and a pencil, so to speak. I, I, I was giving myself a short course on Asia. And I had somehow or another to give myself the posture of an Asian hand, who is my central character in this book. And therefore, I was in a hurry. And uh, so I, I have cut into one community after another, which is itself a spy-like operation. But I was drawn to Hong Kong, of course, because it's the only productive British colony left. And it is frightfully funny to look at the map and see Hong Kong as what is rudely called a pimple on the Chinese arse, uh, this tiny little spot. Um, on it, once again, are all the attitudes of British society encapsulated. You meet people in Hong Kong, you never meet in England anymore. Uh, people who moan about their, their servants, and you find they've got half a dozen. Uh, wonderful things going on. Uh, it's full of anomalies and craziness, uh, and it's still full, mysteriously, of amazing colonial attitudes. So that, that enchanted me, and that was immediately a springboard into the rest of Asia. When you said you'd never seen war, you'd never been shot mm. at, you'd never seen dead bodies, Yes. did you put yourself in the way of all that? Very, very cautiously. <laughs> <laughs> a toe in the water uh, is the right <laughs> description, I think. But uh, I, yes, I, I saw enough of the Cambodian War, never to want to see any more. And uh, I went with the journalists to the front, but of course I did a few times what those war correspondents do all the time, so that uh, much as I would like to, I can't portray myself as a great hero. But therefore, all the places in the Honourable Schoolboy, the places in the jungle where, uh, where that uh, pilot uh, oh, yes, hangs yes, out. Yes, yes all of those I visited, yes. and I made those journeys, and I flew with uh, opium pilots, and uh, I was to some extent making the encounters that he made, but then I was whizzing off here and giving them then, or organizing them in, in, into the form of a fantasy, a, a novel. Many of the characters th th in The Honourable Schoolboy mm -hmm. who you couldn't have got without going there, so yes. putting it on that and program. I, I mean, I did actually import the figure of Old Craw, the Australian, uh, is um, the figure of Dick Hughes, who used to be uh, the Sunday Times correspondent out there, and is an old China watcher, and is a tremendously humorous, sweet man. And I said to Dick, look, Dick, you, know, you are one of those people who just elbows his way into a book and sits around until one gives him a part. And uh, I'm quite definitely going to have to borrow you, or if I'm not allowed to do that, then tell me now and I'll have to choose some very thin, soft-spoken Scot or something like that. And, and Dick said, uh, you know, libel me to the hilt, that's an order. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so uh, then I took his external attributes, as you might say, his gift of narrative, his funny way of talking, and, uh, and his, his, his grosser style, which he cultivates assiduously as an old China hand. Uh, but then when I really began to, to, to pat him around and fit him into the book, uh, he took on quite different properties. But the external furniture of old Craw is, uh, I'm not ashamed to say, Dick Hughes as I saw him. When you read the books, and let's take Tinker Tailor and the Honourable Schoolboy as one, because I think it'll become, or be, yes. it is one yes. massive, great volume, um, there's a very keen sense of a moral centre. Yes. And whenever I think, who holds it, and sort of, where is it? <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems to fall apart. Yes. Well, firstly, of course, they're all looking for it. Uh, and all of them, in a sense, reach a dead end. That is true. But if one's trying to apportion wickedness, whether on the western side or the eastern side, I think one does have to remember as a reality about intelligence services that 
during the balance of terror, they're not only the worst weapons we have, socially speaking, but they're also the best, because to the balance of terror belongs a balance of knowledge. It's no earthly good building up a massive deterrent if you can't do it uh, as against the knowledge you have about the enemy's deterrent. It's equally no good building up a deterrent if you can't let them know you're doing it. Uh, so that it's no earthly good taking uh, intelligence services by themselves and trying to allocate moral good or ill. You might just as well take the army or the air force or rocket designers or missile system designers. Uh, we're all in the same case, or as Smiley would say, we're all in the same war. In the name of what, then, are you asking us to take Smiley's word for it, to reduce it to that? Well, that what he is sorry. going for mm -hmm. is um, better than what Carla is going for. Is going for. Well, firstly, I'm not a communist, uh, nor is Smiley. And uh, communist is an communism is an aggressive revolutionary system. However you dress it up, it is a revolutionary system. It is dedicated to the destruction of the West. Uh, therefore, that does uh, invest us with the responsibility to examine what the West is worth and how we defend it. Uh, as to uh, where I want us to put our, our faith, our belief, our conviction, uh, I think that I see it this way, that I believe Eisenhower once referred to the arms race as mankind crucified on a cross of steel. I think that while the arms race continues, uh, mankind is, is also crucified on a cross of deception and subversion and counter-subversion in exactly the same way. And what one sees is in Smiley is a good man, a decent feeling man who loathes doing bad things, who is actually harnessed to a fearful situation and is doing his best to function. He doesn't come and live down in Cornwall and pontificate on television. Uh, he actually engages. And uh, so one does have a great sympathy for him without, I hope, having too much forgiveness for him. How far do you think that your the structure that you put on your novels enables you to write comprehensively about contemporary politics? Uh, not really very much. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand party politics at all, and I detest them. Uh, I think I can write comprehensively about contemporary ethics, and uh, I suppose that, that I do that. But uh, I have to sound a very loud trumpet uh, here and say that since you lead me down this path, I'm absolutely delighted to talk about it, but I do finally see myself as a storyteller. I mean, I want to... to uh, conform with Ford Maddox Ford's rule about writing, that you've got a guy sitting in the armchair across the fire, he's a bit fidgety, and you've got to keep him there. Um, and, and going back to my nonconformist youth, I want people to sit very still on the pews, uh, so that the first faculty, the first, the first imposition is to entertain. And after that, as Scott Fitzgerald would say, you can tinker around with the preaching. And you lay that on yourself when you write, do you? I don't lay it on myself as a, as a prerequisition of writing. I find that when it's really going, that I, I, I take paths which inevitably involve me in ethical implications and discussion. In, in terms of ethics, then, how do you uh, see a work of fiction? Well, I, I would see it first in the terms which Conrad used to describe why he wrote to make you see, to make you hear, to make you feel. And I think that every evangelist or proselytizer knows that you may, must make somebody do all of those three things uh, in order to awaken his moral conscience. Um, but I don't really see myself as performing an evangelical role. I have, there are things that are, there are irreconcilable contradictions which I long to work out in myself. And uh, it's part of my very good luck to be paid highly for doing that in public. <laughs> Just telling a good story is something that critics certainly and a lot of people think is, a f is, a, is an activity which isn't enough to make no. a novel. No, and 
Uh, I certainly don't think it's enough. You, I, I believe that you have to make your story pay off. Uh, and once the reader knows that he is going to get a beginning, a middle, and an end, you can put all sorts of little things on the back of that vehicle and, and you can get away with it. But to set out with all sorts of abstract, predetermined messages and so on is death. Uh, the story works. If the story really works, then people say to themselves, oh, crikey, what should he have done? Uh, and, and why didn't he do so? Ah, oh, well, he couldn't do so and so because he wasn't that kind of person. So that you bring character and behavior together through motivation. When you look out of the front of your house, you see straight across towards America. Um, and when you look that way, you see a lot of land. Yes. And you have uh, very effectively cut yourself off while being one of the two or three English writers in the big league in America, while being among the two or three leading novelists of your generation. You've cut yourself off in a different sort of uh, literary life uh, from that of all your contemporaries and from that of most of your predecessors. You don't have a metropolitan literary life at all, although you live in London some of yeah. the time, and you don't have a provincial literary life in no, any no, sense at no, all. There are several no, levels on yeah. which that peculiar institution exists, yes. but you don't have that yes. either. Do you feel that, you've, uh, that you are in that position, and have you done it consciously? I've arrived at it consciously. I know that's where I stand now. Uh, I, I love America, and I'm, I've always, since I started publishing there, I've always found that the great European tradition of publishing, for instance, seems to have found its home in Madison Avenue, curiously enough, rather than in London. Um, I, I, when I allow myself to get involved in it. Of course, I, I love American enthusiasm for my work and so on. But it is here that I, I, I draw my, my information from. It's here where I really feel that I know how the game is played. And I'm most at home with English attitudes and things. I really know the language, which I don't in the States. If ever I were to defect from England, so to speak, uh, I, I would have to go to the States, I think. Uh, and the draw of it sometimes is absolutely marvellous, American buoyancy. And, and as a writer, you go there and people have read you and they talk to you. And, and you really feel you're putting your hand on the human heart for the first time. And American optimism is so astonishing. I was just recently in Washington, and suddenly the feeling that politics are about realities, not some ghastly little scandal which seems to have replaced, you know, affairs have replaced politics for us. Uh, but for them, they're really talking about how to win the peace and, or not to win the peace. The, the arguments are about the great issues as they were in Imperial England, Imperial Britain. Uh, and I suppose the, the Empire Baby and Me uh, is very drawn to that kind of debate. Um, but the alternative is what? I, I, I can't cut myself off from English attitudes. Of course I would like to keep more of the money I make. Uh, but if I lived in Southern Ireland, I would end up writing Irish novels, I know. Uh, and, and whose company do you cultivate if you go to some tax-free country? It, it's living death. And when I was poor, nobody tried to throw me out. And now I'm rich, I'm certainly not going. Uh, so that's the way it is. And uh, I, I think probably the way that I, I set off on the Honourable Schoolboy to go to a new world uh, and, and just take material out of it and come back here and work with it was an admission, really, that, that, that the life I lead here by itself is not enough as a writer's life, that I do have to go off and, and refresh myself and, and revive myself uh, because, you know, it actually... I just stuck down here. I'd be writing fifth-rate prose poetry, I know.